For today's episode of the show, I am delighted to be joined by Professor Sanjay Jaram. He is a senior lecturer and chair of undergraduate studies in political science at Simon Fraser University, and he's a national media contributor. He leads us on a deep dive looking at the 2020 conservative leadership race. We examine the history, rules, candidates, and issues that are dominating this crucial contest. So without further ado, on with the show. All right. I am uh, delighted to be joined today by Sanjay Jaram, who is a senior lecturer and chair of undergraduate studies in political science at Simon Fraser University. He's also a regular contributor to multiple national and local media outlets, including but not limited to the CBC, Breakfast Television and the Vancouver Sun. Sanjay, thank you for joining me today. Thanks for having me, Phil. Uh, it's uh, my pleasure. Uh, of course, uh, Sanjay is also an old friend, and so it's always good to uh, talk with you and catch up. Um, but uh, we're not doing that today. Today, instead, we're talking about everybody's favorite topic, Canadian party politics. Who doesn't love Canadian politics? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So uh, the reason for uh, this discussion is because... Uh, uh, soon, uh, the conservative leadership uh, convention is going to wrap up and it's sort of happening virtually uh, this year and voting will conclude. And so we decide, uh, we thought it would be a good idea to talk about um, the leadership race and also talk about the history of conservatism and uh, where it is right now and where it could be going in the future. Um, and so maybe uh, to get us started, uh, maybe you want to talk about sort of what are some of the origins of conservatism and what does it even mean to be a conservative? That's a good start, uh, and I think a source of confusion for, for many people. Now, I think I'd actually start by the idea of liberalism uh, because for most people, when they, most conservatives who define as conservative, conservatives are actually more focused on the liberalism aspect of modern conservatism, the idea that markets should be deregulated, that there should be individuals, that people have firms, uh, and those kinds of things. Traditional conservatism, uh, that, that name has lingered on, really comes from a reaction to the revolutionary changes after the French Revolution, where there's all this challenging of hierarchical power and tradition and the monarchy. And really what conservatism was, was a reaction to that, arguing that change should happen slowly, that privileges were necessary to keep society ordered and functional, that there was a reason why certain people were meant to rule or given more power, because they were the ones that were bestowed uh, sort of naturally with the ability to lead. Uh, so. When you think about those original tenets, it, it's sometimes I find it really funny that we talk about the, we still use the word conservatism because it is obviously, you can still probably trace some of those uh, aspects into what we now call conservatism, but it started off as something very different. Uh, and for most people, I think the, the liberalism aspect, again, now not, you know, not talking about the, the name of the liberal party, but the ideology liberalism, is the most important part uh, of modern conservatism. Yeah, definitely. I mean, uh, often conservatism uh, in contemporary times uh, sort of has a fine line with um, libertarianism, and that no doubt has that, uh, you know, that liberalism origin. Um, okay, so... Uh, it, you know, we're in the 20th, first century right now, um, but the 20th century was filled with uh, really crucial uh, conservative leaders, not only in Canada, but all around the globe. Uh, maybe uh, we want to talk about some of them. Uh, certainly the most famous, uh, Winston Churchill, and then following up in, in sort of a chronological order in Canada and uh, abroad, we had John Diefenbaker, who was the only conservative leader in this country for pretty much 50 years. You have Richard Nixon, Margaret Thatcher, Ronald Reagan, Brian Mulroney, uh, and then Stephen Harper to sort of round it out. Uh, maybe you want to talk about that group or anybody that I missed and, and sort of what those people uh, brought to uh, sort of conservatism as we know it today. Yeah, so I, I'll frame it like this. If we think about... Uh, the last the last 100 years uh, in conservatism, 
trying to then bring it to the Canadian context, I think it's important to, to sort of define this idea of red Toryism. Now, I always have trouble with this term. Uh, it's something that you hear a lot if you listen to debates in conservative circles and in the conservative media, and even in mainstream media, where people mention, well, he's from or she's from the red Tory uh, wing of the party, or that one's a blue, a true blue Tory. I, in, in a nutshell, what they're really talking about is that conservatism in Canada had a sort of a strong community bent or, or a, a state, uh, a state led bent, uh, kind of in a sense, in line to some extent with this con- traditional conservatism that I defined, where it was actually considered good for the state to be strong and the state to be in charge of the economy to some extent, and that there was an importance to maintaining community sometimes over uh, economic gain uh, and the free market. So there was this sort of what we might call a, a red Tory touch to Canadian conservative politics uh, throughout the 20th century. And when you, some of those names you mentioned, uh, I'm thinking uh, Brian Mulroney, Thatcher and Reagan, I believe you mentioned those. To me, those are really, that's really the time when you start to see things start to shake up uh, in uh, elsewhere and then it came to Canada as well. So what you have is a return by Thatcher and Reagan to a more sort of classic, um, almost libertarian bent, but not quite when it comes to how this, the market should be regulated. So both uh, Reagan and Thatcher took on the unions, uh, they slashed social welfare spending, uh, and they car- carried out reforms of that nature, basically with the mantra that the free market should reign and that the state should not be involved uh, as much in the economy as it, had, as it had been, especially in the aftermath of World War II, where most developed democracies developed uh, sort of uh, big uh, welfare states uh, and social programs, often with conservative parties that were influenced by this sort of idea of community-mindedness uh, at the helm. So it wasn't just socialist or centrist parties building up those welfare states, it was conservative parties as well. And you have these two important figures that come along uh, and reach back into uh, older ideas and start to tear it down. Uh, and that's where y- you mentioned Brian Marudi. And I really think that uh, given the timing of which he took over the, again, the progressive conservative party, something we'll get into a bit later about the evolution of the, the conservative parties in Canada, but at that time, it was still the Progressive Conservative Party, where he starts to, um, you know, open up the ideas about free trade in Canada, free trade with the United States, and starts to bring in some of these more libertarian or classic, a better way to say it is classic liberalism into the agenda of the Progressive, progressive Conservative Party. Uh, and we, again, it's really just a nature of ideas being generated, I would say, outside of Canada, coming to Canada and resonating here. Again, there was, you know, many reasons uh, sort of structurally we could look at uh, the, the time of globalization sort of emerging. You have, uh, you had an economic downturn uh, in the 80s that was also um, a big sort of a, a factor that led to this. But again, really it was a, a real sort of shift in ideas, I would say, um, from where red Toryism in Canada being the sort of dominant threat of conservatism started to be challenged by what we now think of as the sort of blue uh, Toryism or blue sort of true blue conservatism. Okay, that was great. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, you bring up a great point about that sort of 80 conservatism, 80s conservatism in uh, Canada, you know, it led to NAFTA. And, uh, and then even subsequent to that, uh, conservatives had a often a globalist uh, free trade agenda and uh, it's interesting now that has has changed um, with this sort of emergence of populism um, yeah. so maybe uh, you can talk about populism how that has emerged and really what its relationship is to not only classical conservatism but modern conservatism so just before I start that answer, I'll just sort of, you know, I think an example just to fill in something you said about free trade, uh, I, we'll come back to this, but if we think about even the, uh, the remember back when, when Peter McKay, who's one of the candidates we're going to talk about, was vying for the leader, again, of at that point, the Progressive Conservative Party, um, 
he was David Orchard was one of his uh, his foes in the leadership race. I think it was 2003. I might have that year wrong, but somewhere around there, where uh, the uh, you know a, a major a major candidate for leader of the party was virulently anti free trade. And again, that that's something that in the the modern conservative movement, uh, again, there might you might see. Uh, is sort of coming back in this sort of new form of populism. But I think that's interesting to the point that you make is that at that point in time, the shift towards accepting sort of open markets uh, and deregulation and opening borders was just part and parcel uh, of what was going on. So let me, let me shift to your other question there uh, about populism. So I'm going to sort of answer this with a sort of Canadian flavor, I think to, to move us in more to the Canadian context. So uh, in Canada, we've had generally, uh, for most people, uh, a two-party system where the two major parties, the Liberal Party of Canada and the, and the various Conservative parties, have vied to lead government. But at various times, we've had these protest parties or kind of third parties emerge um, at different times for different reasons in Canadian politics. And we had the Reform Party, uh, I think, is really a, a really good starting point uh, for our discussion about populism, but also it's important as we go on anyways, is that this party comes along and says, well, you know, and many things is that it, you know, the, remember the slogan, the West wants in, uh, as this party was a, a party uh, of Western protest. But if you dig into some of the, the important key platform planks of that party it was always about, um, about trying to give more power to the people, about trying to reform our institutions, uh, for example, getting rid of the unelected Senate, uh, even within parties, trying to ensure that there was no more party discipline in the House of Commons, that, that the regular representatives of the people, the MPs, were the ones actually making decisions, that these, uh, they had all sorts of ideas along these lines that were really sort of steeped in this idea of populism. Okay, populism is a, it's a, what we might call a thin centered ideology, an ideology that means kind of different things and can be tailored to the right and left. But basically it means that the, the people, uh, the regular folk should be in charge and that elites should sort of see power or be direct representatives of them. Uh, and that we should do everything we can in democracies to allow for more referendums, more participation, uh, that there shouldn't be this sort of channeling where in fact elites have the elites and bureaucracy have all this ability to uh to to make decisions so populism in a nutshell is really about sort of empowering uh regular people to make decisions and so the reform party was about more than that but that was definitely a, a big flank uh of their uh of their party policy and if you think about again what i said about the sort of red tory or the list the kind of mid mid 20th century version of the progressive conservatives that was not uh, part uh, of their uh, of their spiel, right? They were still sort of steeped in mod in traditional conservative ideas about pragmatism, tradition, hierarchy, uh, and again, your listeners are probably thinking now about wow, interesting how if you think about the modern conservative party, how they've kind of sort of walked that tightrope between these two ideas, between respecting tradition and hierarchy and pragmatism and the sort of uh, populism bent that the Reform Party, when they merged, um, uh, brought to Canadian Conservative politics. Oh, okay, yes, that, that's right. I mean, it's, you know, we, it's sort of, uh, we sort of forget that the Reform Party definitely has populist roots, and that was, uh, you know, uh, before sort of the Tea Party emerged in the U.S. or the Brexit happened in the U.K., um, so uh, this sort of leads us to uh, you know the contemporary uh, race, and uh, maybe before we get into what's going on right now, we do want to talk about how we got here. And you brought up the Reform Party, and we mentioned Stephen Harper, and so I think it's really important to talk about that his role uh, unifying the party and sort of recovering the conservative brand in Canada and leading for a decade. Yeah. So just returning then to the reform party is that this party, uh, unlike some other parties in that have emerged in Canada, ended up being a strong force in elections for quite a long time. Uh, in 1993, uh, they became, uh, a, I believe, oh, I could, I'm probably my facts wrong here, is either the Bloc or them, but two of these protest parties became the official opposition. But nevertheless, the party won, uh, swept Western Canada, more or less, in terms of uh, winning 
uh, especially in the prairies, won a whole bunch of seats and became an important force. And then sort of fast forward there from 93, you have quite a few years of liberal dominance. But if you really look back on it, it had a lot to do with this issue of vote splitting, where a lot of those who had conservative ideals, some were voting for the reform party, some were voting, still voting for the old progressive conservative party. Uh, and even the reform party itself started to have its own split uh, or splits of sort of factions between those who were more interested in social conservative aspects, something we haven't talked about yet, versus those who were more interested in the sort of populist libertarianism uh, aspects of the party, which is then leads into you, the shift towards the Canadian alliance, I try to rebrand uh, without getting too deep into that. What you really get to around 2003 is this uh, is this merger where at the time Peter McKay, who was a current candidate um, for the leadership, was at the helm of the Progressive Conservative Party. He had signed, as I mentioned earlier, this anti-merger pact with one of his main rivals within the party, saying that he would not pursue uh, a merger with the Canadian Alliance. Uh, but someone who was at the helm of the Canadian Alliance at that time, someone we know very well, Stephen Harper, uh, had other ideas, and Peter McKay engaged in some secret meetings that have now uh, become sort of public domain uh, about trying to merge the parties, recognizing that the Liberal Party was going to continue to dominate elections unless the, the right united and presented sort of one option that could then compete uh, in all 338 but at that time, probably a bit different number, but in all bodies across the country so that they could try to maximize their seat total and actually take government away from the Liberal Party. And, you know, realistically, you know, if you look at it with so a sober second thought, it's pretty obvious that that was true, is that a first-past-the-post system, uh, as we have in Canada, does not, uh, does not favor parties uh, that are sort of smaller and trying to uh, trying to gauge um, and trying to gain government, is that if a party is large and has... Uh, this both concentrated and widespread support, it's going to be easier for that party to uh, make up for any deficiencies in the popular vote. So that it was a necessary move for the conservative movement to unite. Uh, and those were the two sort of figures at the helm. Now, uh, I feel like this answer is getting long already. So just to say is that when the merger did happen, there was a, a leadership race for this new Conservative Party of Canada, which we know today. Uh, and there was a you know, concern on both sides that who would end up kind of dominating the party? Would it be the Canadian Alliance reform wing or would it be the old sort of red Tory progressive conservatives? Uh, and by all accounts, the, uh, the, uh, the, po the more populist um, reform wing did end up sort of winning the day uh, with Stephen Harper East more or less easily becoming winning the leadership race and taking over the party. Now, of course, we could get into Stephen Harper's adaptations uh, as allowed him to govern, uh, to win government and govern from 2006 to 2011. A lot of that was returning uh, or at least making a lot uh, of concessions to things that he before claimed to be against, for example, um, having a very centralized party, something that he, uh, as a member of the old reform, was very much against, but when he became leader, uh, he accepted, uh, he softened on some so on social conservative issues uh, on Quebec, a whole number of things he softened on when he actually took power of this new uh, bigger party. But the point is that definitely um, the sort of the trajectory of conservative politics in Canada changed at that moment as the Reform Alliance took kind of essentially took control of the party uh, and a lot of its ideas, especially when it comes to um, especially a more free market approach to the economy definitely uh, stayed with the party, uh, and some of its uh, some of its some of its populism did continue as we've talked about. But again, the party did end up sort of softening a lot of its uh, uh, of the old reform agenda to be more marketable to the mainstream. Okay, that's right. And so you know we had this. Uh you know, return to mainstream politics for the Conservative Party, uh, leadership and governing for a decade. Um, so, you know, Stephen Harper leaves, uh, you know, he leaves, he loses an election. Um, on the surface, though, it doesn't seem like things are so bad. They still have a significant amount of seats, a significant amount of the popular vote, um, despite losing a majority. Um, so, uh, 
Then along comes Andrew Scheer. So maybe you want to talk about what happened with him and sort of what went wrong with Andrew Scheer. Yeah, so that's a really nice segue. And I like the way you frame it there that I think there's a lot of a sort of doomsday talk often when a party loses power. But if you really look back at, since 2003 and what the Conservative Party has accomplished, especially again, um, Steve, what Stephen Harper himself was able to accomplish by shaping this new party, holding government again with two minorities, but then getting that, uh, that coveted majority uh, for his last term. And if you look at uh, you know, once again, every in most cases is that three terms in government will lead to some fatigue. Uh, and again, there's many reasons that explain 2015, but we know that's not the topic for today. But when we get to to the last election, and after Andrew Scheer uh, takes over the party, uh, we you know this interesting result that while well, people are quick to blame uh, Andrew Scheer's leadership uh, and his his history uh, of social conservatism. Um, as again, as Peter McKay put it, the stinking albatross around his neck. But if we if we think about it in a sort of more broader context, we see that yes, is that the pop they won the popular vote. Uh, they have not their seat totals have not declined dramatically. And again, it's just it's going to be difficult for a party to win those sort of key seats that it needs to to turn an election uh, and for. The Conservative Party of Canada, that, again, was what Stephen Harper was able to do, especially with Jason K Kenney uh, as his right-hand man, dealing with the sort of more uh, outreach to uh, the sort of new Canadian community, as they'd like to call it, was able to win those key writings in the 905. So what we have, back to sort of serving your question here, um, with Andrew Scheer, what really goes wrong is not some sort of dramatic decline in uh, support. In fact, the Conservative Party's base is rock solid. Uh, this sort of 35%, um, you know, concentrated in certain areas is pretty much going to vote for the party uh, without fail. What you really have is sort of loss of support in these key ridings around uh, in the what we might call the GTA and the greater Vancouver area, these sort of uh, suburban seats that the Conservative Party was able to turn that sort of go back to the Liberals. Uh, and you really have to think about, again, if you, about how those seats were lost. And it, is it, was it really social conservatism? Was it really more to do with the Liberal Party? Um, was it more to do with Andrew Scheer's inability to connect with those voters, something that uh, under Stephen Harper, Jason Kenney was the one really doing that kind of work. So there's definitely, uh, I think people were quick to, sorry, quick to point out that you know, Andrew Scheer's uh, social conservative past was the sort of you know the the force that uh, turned people off in those more urban ridings that the Conservative Party needs to win. But I'm not so quick to draw that conclusion. I think that was a, a factor for sure, but it wasn't the only factor. I do think that uh, the Conservative Party, sorry, the Liberal Party that Stephen Harper faced was a lot weaker in those areas uh, under the leaders that they had during the, that period from 2006 to 2011 is one factor, but also not having um, maybe a sort of exhaustion of that outreach strategy that Jason Kenney was really effective at, at carrying out, sort of going to those communities, sort of connecting with them, speaking um, about their concerns was something that I think that just probably uh, just didn't happen to the same extent uh, in the last election. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you if you know Stephen Harper, right? Like he didn't r come to power immediately. It was sort of like a slow build, right? He was able to uh, knock off the government from a majority. He was still in the opposition, and then he was able to win a minority, then another minority, and then ultimately his majority. And uh, so it's interesting that the party kind of just gave up on Sheer so quickly when. You know, they still maintain, they won the popular vote. They won more seats than last time. So it, it they uh, reduced the government from a majority to a minority. So uh, it's interesting that um, everybody was so quick to get rid of him this time. If I could just jump in there, and uh, I promise I won't do this um, another uh, too much, but I'm just going to, since you mentioned this idea of the slow burn of Harper, this idea that Harper won two minorities before he was able to win uh, a majority. And I, I really think this speaks to, again, the, the birth of a new party. Again, people forget that in 2003. Uh, and just to plug some, uh, you know, uh, for some research I did with two colleagues about how the Conservative Party um, 
their, 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 their attitudes towards diversity and immigration sort of plugged in to this sort of broader argument that we ended up developing uh, with the sort of uh, interesting uh, data we have uh, uh, sort of, uh, that was uh, collected by Vox Pops Labs it is basically that what you see is that the Conservative Party uh, in those early days was trying something else, is that they were trying to build their coalition through a combinate through Western Canada, which was their base, and trying to reach out uh, to Quebec. If we remember Stephen Harper, some back in the early 2000s, was trying to trying very di uh, with much uh, effort to reach out to Quebec. And once that strategy proved uh, unsuccessful to build that majority coalition, then we suddenly saw this this new interest in uh, ethnic minority communities and the GTA and Greater Vancouver as the sort of cre critical number of seats they needed to win. If you sit down and do the math uh, of the ridings in Canada, it is possible to win. People always say that you can't win without the Toronto area and Vancouver. Well, of course you can. Uh, you just need a lot of seats in other, other places. If you won, if you swept Western Canada and swept Mont uh, Quebec outside of the Montreal area, you could certainly get to majority territory. It's very difficult. And that, to me, they won't admit it, but if you look back, I really think that's what the Conservatives were trying to do in those early days after 2003, is to use their base, reach out to more rural, sort of more conservative Quebec uh, as a potential um, uh, base of other seats to get themselves over the hump and, and sort of ignore the Toronto and Vancouver areas. And then once that sort of strategy failed, there was this moment where they were like, you know what, we need to reach out to, to new Canadians. Uh, and that sort of was the, uh, the impetus for what we saw in, and what we still see is a conservative party trying very, with, uh, trying very hard to keep connected to uh, minority communities that traditionally in Canada have been connected to the Liberal Party. Uh, but again, with Andrew Scheer, we saw a little bit of perhaps a little more trouble doing that uh, than we saw, especially when you had a sort of Harper Kenny duo uh, sort of uh, putting their minds towards that issue. Mm hmm. Yeah. OK. And, and you know, you brought up a great topic that I don't know if we can really dive too deep into, but certainly, you know, one of Stephen Harper's uh, failings, at least on paper, was, you know, he put all this effort into winning seats in Quebec and it never materialized. Now, you can maybe argue he did a lot to, um, you know, kind of kill separatism, but certainly, uh, you know, the Conservative Party never was able to yield the seats that uh, Brian Mulroney was able to get in Quebec. So I don't know if that's something that you want to talk about before we head into uh, the leadership race. Yeah, we won't we won't uh, beat that to death. But I mean, the really being somebody who who is not a son of Quebec uh, at the helm of the party is obviously makes it more challenging right off the bat. Is that you know Stephen Harper. He, he was genuine, and uh, I think, in his efforts to try to win Quebec. He had some interesting, certainly if you look back at it, uh, the open federalism idea, uh, and was a 360-degree shift from what the Reform Party uh, had in mind for Quebec, which was essentially, you know, Quebec, uh, tough luck. You know, just deal with it. You're a province like everybody else. And suddenly you had this open federalism, which was effectively sort of asymmetrical federalism that wanted, that was going to give Quebec um, these sort of special accommodations, one, and he was again forwarded that did end up passing and cost him uh, an import, a, a minister who resigned over this, if we remember the, uh, the Quebec as a nation motion that ended up passing, which again, this may sound maybe to a Canadian politics nerd is really interesting, but it's just like the fact that he ended up doing that uh, considering his previous stances on Quebec uh, and the idea of recognizing Quebec as a nation was is remarkable uh, the amount of uh, sort of change in Stephen Harper's tone to Quebec, and so um, I would say that uh, the reason why he was unsuccessful is that I, I think ultimately in Quebec, it's things are changing. And you said something about the death of separatism. Now we could have a whole other debate about that. I, I don't know that it's dead. I think it's certainly just latent um, uh, at the moment, and anything could set that spark off. But uh, for the most part, I think that what happened at that time was that a lot of voters still have nationalist orientations, even if they're not separatists, they have particular uh, cues that they that tend to sort of shape their vote. Uh, and even though he was speaking language of open federalism and, you know, the Quebec as a nation motion, 
were there is that a lot of people w- were still sort of either wanted a leader from Quebec. So if they had a leader like Mulroney who was from Quebec, that may have made a difference, along with some voters who were still unwilling to sort of shift their vote away um, from the bloc or from um, the Liberal Party, which um, would have these leaders that were uh, more connect- connected to Quebec, um, in, in manner of speaking, right? And so that, that to me, I think is maybe a, a poor, but the best explanation I can offer is that someone, I think a leader that was so steeped in Western Canada as their base uh, was alienating to some Quebec voters, or even if they perhaps maybe were intrigued by his sudden new uh, sort of flirtation with Quebec. Uh, I think it was uh, Chantal Hiver called it, uh, um, yeah, uh, he tried to, he, you know, he flirted with Quebec, um, but you know, it just it didn't work out. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, yeah. Okay, so that that uh, leads us uh, to the leadership race. Uh, Sheer, uh, you know, resigning uh, earlier this year or late last year. Um, and um, so uh, maybe before we get into the candidates, maybe you want to talk about how the party even chooses a leader. So, yeah, uh, really interesting stuff is, so just to begin, it's the instant runoff. Okay, well, you know what? I have to go a little bit further back here. So uh, without going into sort of a, a lecture is that parties ha- have evolved in how they choose leaders. So that we can go all the way back to when it was really just caucus that chose leaders, right? Is that you would elect MPs and they would just sit down uh, once they got to the House of Commons and be like, who's going to be a leader? All right, let's vote. Um, that obviously has changed a lot. And a lot of this is an influence from the United States where there's been a sort of long-running democr- within-party democratization. So that's where we see the advent um, of the primaries. Is that a sort of real example of this sort of internal democracy within parties? And so we've seen that same trend in Canada where we moved um, from just having caucus to having what we might call these sort of de- uh, these sort of delegates that were sort of special members of the party. And now, you know, moving forward, we're most, again, Every party has its own slight difference variation in the rules, but now it's been opened up in, within each party. For the most part, card-carrying members are involved in the process. So that's sort of the baseline is that now it's moved from uh, having the caucus decide who is the leader to having the actual sort of you know regular day party members, people who just sign up and pay their money. Again, it's not a lot of effort to become someone who can choose the leader. So that's the first thing. And then we get into the rules, like the instant runoff that the Conservative Party uses. So here, unlike um, what we might do when we go to the ballot uh, box in Canada, where we just tick off one name and we just get one vote and we might think, hey, you know what, I really I really want X to win, but I really hate Y and Z's got a better chance to beat Y. So I'm going to vote for Z. What the instant runoff does is it really is good at mitigating against this sort of strategic voting, because what you do is you rank all of the candidates that are in a race. So this, this particular kind of ballot is used uh, not only in leadership races, but is used uh, actually in, in legislative elections and presidential elections in many countries throughout the world. So it's something that is sort of not something that was unique to the conservative or other uh, leadership races in Canada. It's an electoral system that is often used. So you rank uh, the candidates, and what happens is that there is uh, the once if no if no candidate gets to an absolute majority. So not just winning by a plurality, but getting to an absolute majority. If nobody actually wins the first time around and the first round of counting, then the last person's eliminated and all those ballots that went to the last person, now you real, you reallot them to those, uh, to the second place, uh, choice on those ballots. And so you keep doing this until you, until somebody reaches the critical number. So there's another aspect of this, which gets really interesting. And I hopefully you can ask some follow up questions on this is that it's not even just the absolute number uh, of, of votes that counted that way that decides who ends up being the leader of the Conservative Party. There is a, a weighting system that weights all 338 ridings by 100 points. So think about it this way, is that every single riding across the country counts for the same amount in this race. So I, I, I have a hypothetical example that I think this might make, hopefully this will make sense to listeners. So imagine that Peter McKay, so let's say, let's take a riding. So everybody, you know, everyone knows what a riding is uh, in Canada. It's this, you know, geographically defined area that you, that has an MP. 
Okay. So what happens is imagine that there are, uh, an example, 1,000 voters voting in the conservative leadership race from Vancouver East, uh, the riding that I live in. And it's a riding that is absolutely uh, a no-go zone for the conservative party. They will never win here. It's probably the most uh, solid NDP seat in the entire country. But, you know, there will be con some conservatives in this riding, and they may decide to vote to mail in their ballot. Um, so let's say there's a thousand of them. And let's say that Peter McKay gets seven, uh, 750 and uh, O'Toole gets 250. So uh, McKay just earned himself 75 points and uh, O'Toole has earned himself 25 points. Now, if you sort of scale up and multiply here, you could do the math and realize they're trying to get, I believe the number I'm maybe off, we could look this up. It's 16, it's basically trying to get, if you times 338 uh, by 100, so I think it's 16,901 uh, or something like that you have to get to. So basically you have to get to, if you times 338 by 100, and you divide that by two and then add one, that's essentially the critical number you need to win, right? So back to my example here. So in Vancouver East, mm -hmm. there is a thousand voters, um, and McKay has earned 75 points, and O'Toole has earned 25 points. Now let's go to Calgary Southwest. Why I choose that? That's Harper's old riding, right? Obviously a conservative, uh, stall, a, a very strong conservative riding. Let's say, um, 10,000, uh, voters, you know, I'm making these numbers up just to make them easy to do the math, vote in that riding. And let's say there, O'Toole, uh, gets 7,500 and McKay gets two, uh, 2,500. That equals 10,000, right? I did that math, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Now, uh, O'Toole has earned 75 points and McKay has earned 25. Now, after we have just counted 11,000 votes and by clearly the absolute total has been won by O'Toole in those two ridings, but they, now they are tied because they both have earned 100 points, right? And that's how it works. And you keep doing that in every riding. So once they want, it, it kind of, you have this two levels to it is that the instant runoff where the person who's last when, when it's each time it's being counted, it's being counted by the system of points where it depends where your votes come from um, that determine how many points you have. It's not just total votes. So it's quite complicated for the average sort of uh, armchair politics uh, watcher to follow. And hopefully my example helped to some extent uh, or at least intrigued you to go look at, you know, I, I find that when I'm, for example, when I'm teaching this stuff is that using an interactive map and kind of pulling it out really kind of shows you what it means, right? And for me, uh, the real interesting, uh, another interesting part of this system is that it really, it really changes the, the nature of the race is that you have to, you have to target your messaging across all ridings, regardless of where you think you can win. And if I could sort of add my, now I'm getting outside of, uh, you know, sort of established procedures here into my opinion on this, if you think about it, if the Conservative Party needs to win these certain amount of ridings to win the election, and they more or less know the ridings they're targeting, to me, some, that's the sort of downfall of this system, is that you can have somebody, not that it's necessarily going to happen, but if you have somebody who's winning or picking up points in these ridings like Vancouver East that have just absolutely no value to the Conservative Party because they can never win a seat here, wh what does that really do in terms of trying to choose a leader that's going to... Uh, be electable and also to be, um, yeah, I mean, that's really it, is to, to end up being the most electable leader. Again, you can't, the argument, the counter argument would be you can't ignore uh, members of the Conservative Party who happen to live in ridings that they can't win in, right? Is that they're members of the party, they may donate and they're, uh, you know, want to, their voices have to be heard, right? Fair argument. But again, I think that this system definitely uh, has that sort of kink in it where, well, all these ridings that the Conservatives are never going to bother with. Uh, you know, that, that end up having, could having an impact on the outcome. Yeah. And your example was good. I, I mean, if people want a practical example, they can just look back to the conservative leadership race in the province of Ontario from a couple of years ago, which didn't quite have, I don't believe it has the same scoring, but um, despite 
uh, Christine Elliott, you know, winning the majority of the votes, it was Doug Ford who was able to manipulate the, you know, the voting system and exploit, you know, the higher value of rural area votes to ultimately uh, obtain the leadership. So it's a sort of similar uh, scenario. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, so this brings us uh, to uh, the race. Uh, you talked about the process and how they're going to decide. So I guess it's time to talk about who is running. Um, so right now we have four candidates. Um, we've already you've already mentioned two, so maybe we'll start there. We'll start with the most sort of famous of them all, and that would be Peter McKay. Uh, you know, he has a long history, so maybe you want to talk about uh, you know who he is and how he got to this uh, leadership race. Yeah. So uh, a, a Nova Scotia MP, um, he's had a long history in politics. I believe he started quite young. Uh, I recall that by the time he became leader of the Progressive Conservatives, he's only 38. So that if you if you sort of walk back the years there anyway, he's a he's a he was a fairly young entrant in, entrant into politics, um, comes from a political background. His father was also uh, an MP for the Progressive Conservatives. So it was sort of no surprise that he ended up sort of uh, dipping his feet into politics. Uh, he ended up being somebody, an important figure. Now, I'm, again, I already told the, the narrative of how he ended up taking the leadership of the Christian Conservative Party on the premise that he would not merge with the alliance, went ahead uh, and did so. And I think uh, his legacy will always, in some ways, be shaped by that, I think, is that for some, you know, he made the necessary move to bring the conservative uh, to bring conservative politics back to the mainstream. For others, it was uh, you know his integrity was uh, questioned by the fact that he went he walked back on a pact uh, that he signed. Nevertheless, I think I think history. My assessment of that is that history has sort of looked uh, has shone pretty well or looked looks pretty looks pretty well uh, for him uh, if you look back at that decision uh, in terms of how the party ended up succeeding uh, and doing what they uh, what Stephen Harper and him intended. Um, but from there, he ends up, even though he loses the leadership, he stays within the Conservative Party and, and remains a, a strong foot soldier within the party, taking on various uh, ministerial portfolios uh, for the party. Uh, not necessarily economic ones, but certainly I believe he was the, uh, at certain, he was definitely the Minister of Justice at, at a certain point. Again, that was a, a during he was over a period. Minister of Defense as well. Defense, defense and yeah, Justice. So I think in roles that, that Harper felt, you know, suited uh, his personality, especially when it comes to his time in justice. I think that those omnibus reforms about sentencing, something that he had always uh, been pretty strong on this, uh, this idea of longer sentences and sort of tough on crime approach, something that he was the face of for that government. So he took uh, some of the criticism that it received, especially from those who felt that the, that the, that the time when that the conservative government was taking uh, heat, for not using scientific principles about to decide certain policies like that one, where the you know the research had said that long sentences don't deter, and yet they were undeterred uh, about going ahead uh, with those policies. So he was the one, you know, he was put in charge of that. Um, uh, so he he definitely has. I, I think the sort of moral of the story here is that even though he came from the sort of, uh, and it was sort of marked as a, a red Tory, someone who was a, a centrist, a moderate, uh, you know, he was a, a pretty strong figure within the Conservative Party post Harper, uh, sorry, during the Harper years. And the Harper years were again, were this period where the party was shaping itself into a party that was of course, uh, like I said, moderating, but certainly still controlled uh, and shaped by some of the Canadian Alliance reform principles. Um, and I think that really, uh, you know, that is something that's going to be talked about, has been talked about a lot as this leadership campaign has unfolded about, you know, who is, is Peter McKay just trying to bring the party back to pre-2003 and to make, to remake the Progressive Conservative Party in the name of the Conservative Party? Has he changed? Um, would he fit in with the new party? Can he win over the more social conservatives or even the sort of, even the sort of moderate uh, social conservatives who want, who are not sort of as progressive on more identity issues and things like that. Can he win them over? These questions are uh, strongly in the discourse uh, because of that history he has. But yet, I think for him and what he's continually, what his uh, his team has continued to try to stress is that he, uh, again, during those Harper years, that he was a strong figure in the party, held these portfolios, and even during his campaign, you've seen him. I'll just bring up one example. 
Um, and again, it was somewhat of a blunder, I think, by most accounts. But I, to me, it really speaks volumes where he came out um, and uh, to criticize or sorry, to support those vigilantes who were blocking um, who are blocking pipeline construction. Again, excuse me if I don't have the details quite right, but the, the, the general story is right, is that his, his, he released a tweet criticizing these, uh, I believe it was, sorry, I believe it was supporting uh, those who were um, trying to remove protesters along um, uh, a line of an infrastructure project. So again, it was this battle between those who wanted the project to go uh, and against those who were, um, who were in First Nations and other supporters who were trying to block this project. And he supported those who were who showed up and tried to take sort of the law in their own hands, as it were. Uh, and that was interesting because, right, that doesn't really fit with who I think most people think Peter McKay was supposed to be in this race. You know, someone who was supposed to be the moderate, supposed to progressive, was supposed to show sensitivity to these kinds of issues. But then he was go he went ahead and, you know, his team, not him personally, he came out later and said that it was his team who made a mistake. But I think, you know, again, his, his own inclinations to sort of define himself uh, within this race is not the sort of, you know, the mushy center um, has been pretty clear. And whether that's because he needs to do that to win the leadership and he'll worry about who he, who he is in the in the national uh, campaign later to defeat Trudeau and he'll worry about that later. But it's interesting because we've definitely seen um, him trying to, to sort of push back against that sort of model of him as just being um, a face of the old progressive conservative party. Okay, and uh, I think it's fair to say that he he's you know the biggest name in the race and and uh, one of if not the strongest candidate. So maybe let's move on to the next strong candidate, uh, which would be Aaron O'Toole. Aaron O'Toole has been around for a while. If you've uh, if you're familiar with Ontario, um, so um, what do you have to say about Aaron O'Toole? Yeah, again, similar kind of story. So something that, you know, just Peter McKay's, I believe, you know what, uh, three of the candidates are lawyers, I, I believe. And I think uh, Aaron O'Toole is a, a, another one of the lawyers, um, is that he uh, went to law school, has a military background, has been in politics uh, for quite many, uh, quite many years right now, has again, similar to McKay, has that political history in his family. I believe his father was also in politics. So he, he enters, um, and wins in Durham, which uh, for those who are listening outside of the Greater Toronto Area would know would not know necessarily this is part of the key sort of GTA battleground that is a, a force at least has been become an important component of these battles between the Liberals and Conservative parties and the Conservative Party in elections. So him having a seat there, I think right off the bat, being from the GTA and having that base, I think is a sort of something that a lot of people have pointed to as an important aspect of him. Now, about O'Toole, uh, unlike McKay did not contest the last leadership that Shear won, McKay, sorry, O'Toole did. And O'Toole came third, uh, running behind Shear and Maxime Bernier. Uh, and the nutshell of that one is that you had, you had um, Maxime Bernier, who was really strong, a strong fiscal libertarian, and was really galvanizing that wing of the party and those ideas, and was able to, to you know, did remarkably well in that leadership campaign and only lost uh, and led for most of it and only lost uh, kind of really on a I think on the you know eighth iteration or something like that um, when we're going through that sequence um, that I talked about earlier with the system that they use. Uh, O'Toole was always there in the background in that race and ended up third but never really seemed to was never really the strong contender that Shear uh, sort of the, in, in the race like it was it was really between Shear uh, and Bernier and Looking back on it, uh, and why some people may not remember him, is that at that point, he was uh, what I think some people think McKay is now, is that sort of um, the centrist, uh, very soft-spoken, uh, eloquent, not necessarily aggressive with how he was campaigning in that leadership campaign, uh, without any strong sort of memorable positions on anything, that he was sort of uh, trying to come through the middle. Essentially, you had Andrew Scheer, who didn't obviously had uh, you know made his made his position clear that he wasn't going to reopen certain things but obviously was willing to play footsie uh with social conservatives especially to win those the second uh ballot support 
on form from some of the social conservative candidates. That was, you know, pretty obvious that that is well documented. And you had Bernier with this sort of strong libertarian bent. And you had O'Toole trying to come up the middle and be the sort of marketable candidate that uh, that was that he argued could take on um, Trudeau in a in a national campaign. However, this time around, we're seeing a very different kind of Aaron O'Toole. Uh, we're seeing an Aaron O'Toole that is willing to be angry on social media, uh, to be very aggressive, and even his 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 uh, slogan "Take Canada Back." Uh, is very different in tone than what we saw during that last uh, conservative leadership campaign when he was he was not taking uh, sort of using sort of populist rhetoric uh, within um, his appeals to the party base. So I think those things to me really stand out. Um, and again, he's I think that his also he's been somewhat flirting with social conservative leanings and not necessarily coming out with any particular policy that is going to, that I could point to say, well, this is something very different, but he's certainly been more open uh, to uh, social conservative ideas uh, and trying to win over that base. Uh, and I think, again, this is from, I think I agree with the assessment of some conservative insiders that this is just sort of pure opportunism is that he's trying uh, uh, to shape his, um, his campaign in opposition to McKay and not trying to sort of use McKay's past uh, in the press and sort of against him and trying to position himself as the true blue. He calls himself this, the true blue candidate, uh, the one who best uh, exemplifies the, mo the ideals of the modern conservative party, not the old progressive conservative party. And I think it goes to show uh, his biggest endorsement, I would say, to date is from Jason Kenney. Uh, and the fact that Jason Kenney is supporting him really shows a lot uh, about how Ar who Aaron O'Toole is trying to shape himself to be um, in this race. I wouldn't say, again, we don't want to sort of just sort of evoke or compare everything to Stephen Harper just for the sake of it. But I mean, I do think that there, there's something interesting there um, that he um, became, you know, more aggressive, uh, has, has imposed a more aggressive stance on certain you know, foreign policy issues, um, came out earlier in the campaign, uh, even though he uh, sort of walked that back and talked about how his sort of his connection to um, the, his military history and his connection to um officers in uniform would prevent him from marching in, in pride parades and things like that have been his, sort of a part of this redefinition of him from the last campaign where he's trying to show, to, show himself as this true blue uh you know not necessarily a social conservative but someone who can definitely get on board with those ideas uh, and i think that's the way he wants to try to win this leadership again for me in both cases mckay and o'toole how they're both kind of stumbling to define themselves as a, a more, more quote unquote conservative is really interesting. And I think so is a lot about how difficult it is to win a leadership race. And perhaps they're both more worried about that right now and worried about how to win the election afterwards. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think, uh, I think this, uh, I think what you're saying about trying to pull in those uh, social conservative votes um, I mean, it's directly related to uh, the next two candidates that we'll talk about who the reality is neither of these people is going to win. So you want to get their votes. Yeah. And I think slightly, you know, even if even if you're not going to institute a policy, those voters want to know that you're on their side. Um, so maybe we'll talk about uh, then uh, the first of these two sort of underdog candidates and that would be one of them who's never been elected to office and that would be uh leslin lewis so what do we know about leslin lewis uh another a, a lawyer uh has tried to win a seat uh in a coveted sort of area on the edge of the city of toronto a, a difficult seat that cares to win but something that is a uh, winnable scarborough rouge river uh, was unsuccessful, but did had a fairly strong showing if you compare her vote totals uh, to other similar ridings for the Conservative Party. Um, somebody who is pitching herself in a really interesting way is that she has these social conservative viewpoints that she's made here. She said, well, it's important not to hide who you are. Um, what that translates into practice, though, again, at the moment, it's a little hard to tell. Other than her and Derek Sloan both made a case that they would be against, uh, they would prohibit sex selective abortion, uh, which again, if you think of it in the grand scheme of things, is not, uh, isn't really walking back um, 
it's wading into the abortion debate, which again is a big deal, obviously, no matter what, but is not as dramatic uh, as perhaps some might assume that they actually have written down in their platform. So she is definitely uh, somebody who has, you know, used her own uh, experience. I believe I believe she had a um, an unwanted pregnancy uh, when she was in law school or earlier in her life, uh, and has used that, talked about that openly as a way to sort of, I think, ground her views on abortion and uh, maybe try to change the way people think about this debate in binary terms. So really interesting. A, a very well spoken, um, eloquent. Um, person who is tr trying to sort of uh, infuse and sort of update social conservatism uh, for the masses. Um, I would say that, you know, in, in many ways, again, try to, try to tie the conversation back to the other candidates, a lot of the things that she has mentioned are, are not that different. Uh, you know, repealing uh, some of the, the acts of the Liberal Party, uh, like the, the National Energy Board Assessment Agency Act that we remember as this uh, people called the no pipelines uh, bill, um, and, and that also the crude uh, the crude tanker uh, bill C forty eight. It was also considered part of the liberals, considered by you know the 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 right as an attack on the the, the uh, first industry. She is talking only about um, revoking those, gradually eliminating the budget, uh, approving more LNG products. Sorry, projects, but then. Um, offering these sort of kind of boutique tax credits to clean up oil and gas spills, which in her environmental um, positions are a lot more nuanced, I would say, than uh, we've seen from conservative candidates in the past. We might expect from somebody who has been sort of labeled as a social conservative. Uh, you know what? I'm, and she's also wants to repeal the, the firearms ban. But again, all those things I've mentioned and trying to link this back here, those positions are exactly the same as McKay and O'Toole. And so even though I'm sort of highlighting we're highlighting these candidates in isolation, I think an important point to be made is that there's a lot of similarities between these three candidates in particular. I think Derek Sloan is a bit of an outsider, shares some of these positions, but, you know, he's been, like you said, a, a little more um, outspoken on social conservatism. But the core uh, of Leslie Lewis's uh, run to be leader is really based in some of these sort of standard uh, ideas that um, that the Conservative Party is running on, on um, sort of re re uh, reinvigorating the energy sector by repealing these bills, walking back some of the changes uh, in, for example, the firearms bill, uh, reducing the budget and sort of getting back to a more fiscally conservative uh, government. All these things, all three candidates share. So the fact that Leslie Lewis has the social conservative slant gives her this uh, sort of interesting uh, component to her. The fact, again, we can't you know, shy away from the fact that being a female, uh, a visible minority background is also something that makes her embrace and she's been pretty open about talking about that uh, and at various times uh, has been uh, sort of, you know, subjected to tough questioning about whether she feels that she's representing her gender and her race properly with the views she gives, but then has been pretty, you know, pretty outspoken that um, she believes sort of uh, how identity politics business that she has a particular role to play as a female uh, and some of my of my background, but is trying to uh, demonstrate that that those things do not determine your political viewpoints, and that uh, someone uh, of her background can also express these sort of traditional conservative values. So I do think that um, she brings a really novel, interesting uh, aspect to this. But do I think that you know her her potential her potential to become leader is small i mean there's been a lot of talk recently about um her the, the sort of success she's having and the fact that she's doing a lot better than people think uh and the, maybe she's potentially going to be the spoiler and those who the, the, those who choose her their second choice is going to be uh are going to be really important which uh, again most people think will be o'toole um but uh, again uh, it is possible, I would say, that she could be a dark horse in this race and potentially, especially given that we have a sort of mail-in ballot system um, and we have perhaps potentially a large pool of voters that um, are voting in the leadership race for the first time, um, that it, it, she, is, she does have an outside shot at winning, although it's still a small one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, on paper, like if you were just sort of looking uh, from afar, she looks incredibly qualified. Like she has uh, really good credentials in her uh, in private life. I mean, she doesn't have 
the political experience, but in some ways that's good nowadays. People want outsiders and uh, the other two leaders that we mentioned are, you know, lifelong uh, politicians. So it's, it's in some ways it's, it's uh, confusing why she isn't doing better, but then even though her social conservative leanings might be nuanced, as you say, that seems to not matter for the majority of of Canadians. And uh, I think if the conservatives need to figure that out. Um, OK, so then uh, we, that leaves us with the last candidate who you mentioned is sort of the most different. And that would be Derek Sloan. So what do we know about Mr. Sloan? So he, he does hold a seat uh, in eastern Ontario, uh, an area of Ontario that is you know, far outside the GTA where the Conservatives tend to do well and are really challenged uh, to a great extent by the Liberal Party. Uh, we know that he has been an outspoken um, in the House of Commons with his social conservative views. Uh, and I, I don't know if I said this in lieu, but you know, when it comes to the abortion issue, he's a little bit, he's quite a bit stronger than her, um, where she is committed to prohibiting sex uh, selective abortion. He has actually uh, sort of, sort of really reopened that debate to a great extent uh, and prohibits uh, mid uh, mid birth abortions. Again, what exactly that means, uh, I don't really know. I mean, I would presume it's sort of again in simple terms, uh, rethinking the time periods in which abortions are legal. Um, and uh, this sort of really novel, I think, I, I think, you know, this, this policy that I read about sort of looking at his, uh, his platform really kind of shows um, his, his unabashed social conservatism is requiring that pregnant women see an ultrasound of their pregnancy before conducting an abortion, which, again, is, again, shows, I think, really shows the kind of more extreme version, uh, sort of extreme social conservatism that he's uh, advocating uh, a kind of law that I, I can't imagine that a becoming you know a law in Canada and b withstanding the various court challenges that would get thrown at it. Uh, and so he, he's really willing to kind of kind of go go out outside the bounds. Of, I think of what is what is really possible. Um, and I think you know that differentiates him and Leslie Lewis. But other than I mean, you have you know, you side the conservative issues. You know, you have a lot of, again, on energy, the deficit, um, you have pretty much the same positions that you have with the other candidates. Um, but again, when it comes to the, you know, the environment, he's a little <coughs> stronger um, in terms of funding a lot of these sort of organizations that, um, that you know, that, that have an environmental, pro-environmental voice. Um, so, he, like I said, I mean, I'm really, to me, Derek Sloan is not... Unlike unlike Les and Lewis, I'm willing to say that he has no shot to win this. Um, I, I think Les and Lewis is a a dark horse, um, given the rules. You know, things are cool, but there's no. Shot. The important thing here to think about with him is that who are his second place votes going to go to? Are they going to go to, to Les and Lewis? And are those are there enough votes out there who are resigned to voting for either? If we think about it this way: Is it if there is a social conservative pool out there of voters who are just going to vote uh, and rank according to social conservative values, or, who are going to maybe vote uh, Lewis second, and then does Les and Lewis have other votes outside of that pool of voters as well, who maybe she might get some second votes elsewhere or some first place votes to somehow come out uh, as a dark horse and win this? That to me is Derek Sloan's sort of you know point. Uh, and a contribution here is that R is going to only ask. Uh, I think he, I believe he has already. I believe he's instructed, or maybe sort of mentioned that he thinks it likely his supporters will choose Lesson Lewis as their second uh, choice. So that's where I, I think his uh, his role comes into play. Is that is he going to put create a situation where it makes it possible for a, a kind of surprise victory for Lesson Lewis, um, or will his Will people will his second place votes be spread out and perhaps then lead to a more sort of uh, an early battle between uh, O'Toole and McKay before getting into you know as we get once we get to the you know the the, the second and third round where this is really going to be happen um, because we know in, in the first round it's unlikely that anybody will reach that total number of points uh, that they need to win. Okay, that's great. Okay. 
All right, good. Okay, so we've got the candidates and uh, it seems appropriate to talk about the issues. We sort of touched on some of those issues, but to be frank, there seems to only be one issue right now. And that's, you know, coronavirus, COVID, and the economy slash recovery. So um, maybe you want to talk about their position on that, or if you think that there are other issues that really seem to, that will matter uh, in this vote this week. Um, when we think about coronavirus, I think we start with, uh, if, if Peter McKay sort of shot himself in the foot, by when coronavirus uh, hit and making a, a case that the leadership race continue on as scheduled, right? Is that, I mean, I think that's sort of, uh, you know, over been, it's cycled out of the news uh, cycle already, uh, but it's an interesting, interesting bit of information. And I wonder, I would suspect that they probably regret that now. I know it through the interview, again, Peter McKay hasn't really said much about um that since uh, i think i believe that he's maybe sort of softly apologized for it but i wonder but to me that was sort of the beginning of a number of things that kind of made this race close i mean it maybe it was pretty close anyways but he certainly didn't help himself because i think that like you said the focus on coronavirus and the recovery and, and you have uh basically everybody else in consensus that the race should be delayed and you have peter mckay saying that it should you know, continue on as is was certainly a really jarring event um and maybe in the minds of some who are not um gonna sort of walk through uh, all the details of each's platform and uh uh blind by line they think well you know what peter mckay is i can't trust peter mckay with uh, the recovery Re 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 excuse me because he doesn't even think it's that important so i do think that uh in terms of a cue that may have had an influence uh, on certain people, but you know, getting into the real nitty gritty, um, I yesterday this is where I was really kind of trying to figure out, okay, what are the real differences between uh, these candidates? And in terms of the things that you are are talking about, um, coronavirus um, and uh, economic recovery, there isn't a whole lot uh, to really sort of differentiate them. They both talked about. Uh, the overspending um, of the local government and both want to eliminate eliminate and balance the budget within a short amount of time frame. I don't think either is committed to a specific time frame. Uh, they both feel that you know energy energy products or uh, the um, the energy industry is still going to be as you know again as is normal for the Conservative Party in Canada is still an important pillar of Canada's economy and that they believe that. The Liberal Party has done a lot to uh, undo um, and sort of uh, destroy the, the the energy industry, and they want to sort of go about their business, repealing certain bills and reinvesting in the energy industry. Those kind of things they, they sound all similar, and when it comes to sort of um, kind of the, the policy differences, it's really hard to you know. I remember something you know Peter K. and attacked. Uh, a tax credit for uh, retrofitting that sort of stood out to me as well. That, that sounds uh, like one of those Harper Air boutique tax credits that I think for the most part um, O'Toole is avoiding uh, talking about because I think, you know, there may be just, it may just be not part of his platform. It may be something strategic, but I don't, I, I'm, I'm really questioning uh, as I get closer to this race, how much small differences like that are really sort of shaping um, people's opinions uh, about what's going on. And I know you wanted to talk about this, but honestly, I don't have a whole lot to say that's going to be really interesting about, okay, here are the different positions on economic recovery that the two sort of main candidates have that may differentiate them in the minds of voters. What I really think seems to be within the media cycle and what seems to be at stake is how, how both, you know, perhaps the, the campaigns of both, and especially kind of the flubs uh, that both have had some misstep in terms of what they said on social media, but more importantly, the electability uh, of these candidates. Because I think what the, the base seems to be um, attuned to right now, especially after Andrew Scheer and the fact that there was a sort of strong current within the party to get him to resign after, you know, after losing the election, despite improving the seat count and popular voters, we talked about, 
there's obviously a, a high a sensitivity to the, the notion of what is who can win, who can beat Justin Trudeau. And that seems to be the way they're jockeying with each other. It doesn't seem to me like they're jockeying too much on specific policies, because if you really just go down the list of core issues, there's not a whole lot to real to really dig into and be like, okay, here's a here's a deep difference. Now again, I apologize if I'm if I'm missing something here, but again, that's been my reading uh, of what's been going on. No, I I, I agree. I think yeah, the, the, you know the the most important issues they do generally sound the same, uh, and yeah, it 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 does. It, I don't think that you know there is really a large appetite for social conservatism, despite that still being a large vocal part of the party um, and an influential part. Um, so I do think, as you say, it's going to come down to quote unquote intangibles like leadership and electability. And in in you know to comment on these boutique tax cuts, you know I, there's a pretty if you're sensible, there's a good reason why you're not proposing these things because you can't afford to do these things. Those things made sense mm -hmm. in an economy of, you know, modest GDP growth. You know, we have to do some major spending initiatives, which also means some major taxing initiatives. And so that's one of the most curious things about uh, this upcoming, uh, not just the leadership race, but the election is I don't see how conservatives are going to be able to position themselves as tax cutters. Um, it it just doesn't it doesn't make sense. We need to pay for these things somehow. Yeah, and so as you were you know as you were mentioning that, I was just kind of like scanning some of the notes that I made um, on the different policy positions, and if you just really go up and down the list. I mean, on immigration, renegotiating the Safe Third Act, uh, sorry, the Safe Third Country Act of the United States, you have both of them considering sort of aggressive action against China that they've made public uh, as part of their campaigns, repealing the, um, the, the federal firearms bill. I mean, it just goes on and on where that they're just so similar on so many sort of core, I would say, sort of meat and potato policy issues that it's, it's just very difficult, I think, to really kind of dig and find like, what is what, what am I voting on here? Mm hmm. Okay, so uh, now that we've done that, well, let's let's have the fun part. It's prediction time, right? So voting concludes on the twenty first, but it is mail in voting because of COVID. So uh, we won't know the results for uh, you know maybe a week, ten days, two months. Who knows how long it takes them to figure these things out? There's going to be all sorts of hanging chads, I'm sure. Um, so what are your thoughts? Who's who do you think is going to take it? And I'll give you my prediction as well. My prediction is that Aaron O'Toole will win. I don't, I was trying to, I wish I had better prepared for this question because I knew it was coming. But it's a gut feeling I have along with the fact that I think Peter McKay's campaign has just been a real train wreck. He came out as, uh, as the leader, as sort of the front runner in this. And what we have like since then you know, starting uh, with that social media blunder um, on, regarding uh, those vigilantes, you have uh, a number of other kind of missteps. You have him calling for the race to uh, continue despite COVID. And he just really hasn't, he hasn't really been impressive uh, when it comes to uh, using his, his longevity in the party, his status, his name. I think he's done only things to sort of undermine his status uh, as the front runner. And I think that uh, with O'Toole, I really do think that the fact that he, he has a seat in the greater Toronto area, I do think that with party insiders, that holds a lot of sway. And as he sort of strengthened his position and been able to reach out and become a more, uh, a more true blue conservative candidate uh, and sort of shape himself that way, I think that the insiders who know that well, we can. We have a guy here who has been who's playing well in Alberta, right? So he has Jason Kenney's blessing. Going well, he has a seat in the GTA, uh, and so I do think insiders have seen O'Toole's emergence throughout this campaign, even though it's been overshadowed by COVID, and seen that we think I believe that they think this is the guy who can win, and I do think that has been that has trend sort of subtly sort of transmitted to the base 
who, for people who, like I said, for reasons maybe because the, the, the policy positions are so uh, hard to differentiate and there's like, not a lot of daylight between the two, are maybe taking a second look at O'Toole and thinking, well, I thought McKay was the obvious choice, but, you know, he doesn't seem to be, he seems, his campaign is a bit disorganized, his, his team has uh, made all these mistakes, social media mistakes, O'Toole has been really strong and his, uh, his performance in the debates was strong. Um, he can win. He has this sort of base in the GTA, which is helpful for the party. Jason Kenney, uh, someone I think that most concerns in Canada, a look highly on, ha- has given uh, his uh, blessing to. I do think that all those factors put together are really is what's going to shape uh, undecideds within this leadership race and, and get them to cast their vote for O'Toole. I do think it's going to be close, but I, th- I think ultimately O'Toole uh, will win. All right, so not to make you the only one with the prediction, I'm going to make mine, and uh, I will concur with you. I believe that Aaron O'Toole will take it um, for the reasons that you mentioned. He's had a solid campaign. He's already had a leadership race where he's learned from the mistakes. He knows the nuances of the party voting system. You, we already know about adjustments. You know He's being more aggressive. I think it's to position himself as a leader. And Peter McKay, along with blunders you know, during this campaign, he's had blunders throughout his political career. Um, you know, as you mentioned before, you know, turning on his pact to never unify the Conservative Party. I think people can confer- forgive that because it was the right decision in the long run for the health of conservatism. But then he's had some missteps with, you know, he took a personal chop he took a chopper like a military chopper on a vacation uh and then he had this relationship with belinda stronach and i'm not one to you know talk about people's relationships but they made it public and he kind of got played by her so it's sort of a poor judgment and i think people will remember these things and i mean i don't know anything really bad about aaron o'toole like i can't he has a military career so i think there's a lot of things going for him all right okay so we get a leader right and that leads us to the next question and we've already talked about it whoever this is is most likely going to have to go against justin trudeau unless you know trudeau isn't prime minister by that time which you know could be the case (laughs) who knows um but uh what uh, what are your thoughts on what we're going to see in the next election, when we're going to see an election? I think it's fair to say that um, even though there doesn't seem to be an appetite for it in the country, it's to the Liberal Party's advantage to get an election sooner rather than later. Um, so maybe you want to give your thoughts on uh, where we're going to go after the uh, leadership selection. Ah, that's a lot of questions. And this is the yeah. political scientist, the least favorite party's interviews all when you get into this sort of speculative uh, questions. But uh, I'll, uh, I'll do my best with this. I mean, I, I don't think that my, my gut feeling is that there will not be an early election. Um, I do think we're going to be waiting. It might be earlier than absolutely, absolutely obligatory, but I don't think we're going to see one in the next few months. I do think that the coronavirus issue is certainly going to uh sort of i think delay any possibility of an election again anything could happen with a minority situation again uh you know obviously both the conservatives and the ndp have have threatened um with a non-confidence vote at various sort of junctures in this but i I don't think that it's the moment um that any of them want to pull the trigger for their i think for their own personal reasons especially you know once the conservatives choose this leader um then they're going to want a little bit of time for that leader sort of to connect with Canadians. So I, I think it's going to be a little while before we see uh, an election. And let's just presume that it's Aaron O'Toole that, um, that does win this race. Again, it, even if it's been a McKay, and it doesn't change a whole lot in terms of, I think, the strategy. Uh, I think for both of them, I think the strategy is the same in the sense that neither is going, I don't think either is going to play that well in Quebec. I mean, again, the, the climate in Quebec, again, Quebec politics is a lot more diverse than people think. And I, I do think that, again, well, you have uh, Francois Legault, who is uh, arguably one of the most fiscally conservative uh, premiers uh, in the country that was elected with a strong majority of populace. So isn't what people think? Nevertheless, I think when you have a leader 
uh, from a different part of the country with weak French. I mean, Ushul is a little better than McKay, but both of them are still not great and don't really have that ability to connect uh, in French with uh, Quebec audiences. I do think it's going to make that's going to be uh, somewhat difficult for them, uh, especially if Blanchette continues to perform strongly in the House of Commons, which he has. Uh, I do think it's going to be very tough for either of them to make a breakthrough in Quebec, which is then brings us back to, I really, it just comes back to trying to replicate the uh, the Harper model of the majority and trying to win back uh, the greater Vancouver area uh, and the greater Toronto area, along with maintaining the base uh, in the prairies and in rural, sort of rural Canada. And I think both of them have the capacity to, do, I have the capacity to do that. I, I do think that a lot of those seats um, that the Liberals have turned back um, are, they're, they're in play. I do think we, we, we don't have, this is not a podcast about the Liberal Party's performance, but we all know that they've had some issues uh, uh, over, over their period in government that have made them vulnerable. And we've seen that in opinion polls, that each time there has been one of these scandals that's come out, their opinion, their popularity takes a hit. Yes, they've, Justin Trudeau has been uh, very strongly recovered from a lot of those uh, gaffes uh, in terms of uh, public opinion. Uh, will he recover this time around? Uh, let's say in the current context, we're talking, we're having this discussion on August 11th and, you know, the We Charity scandal is still making the cycle. Will he recover from this one? Tough to know, but all of those things collectively are obviously going to make them vulnerable with the fact there will be voter, like there always is when you have a two-term government, even, even though they've had one majority, one minority, there will be some voter fatigue come, come the next election. So I do think that uh, the Liberals will be vulnerable it's just a matter of whether the the whoever is the leader can they can again the party has become very effective at this sort of micro targeting uh using sort of a data driven approach to targeting voters in those key swing ridings uh which again is going to look very different than this leadership campaign like i said winning the becoming the leader uh under the rules that we explained earlier in this show is a lot different than winning a federal election so uh Whoever does win is going to have to pivot very quickly. But I think, again, I'm, without making a firm prediction, I do think that uh, assuming it's McKay or even Leslie Lewis, but I mean, let's just stick with, you know, McKay and O'Toole, I, I think both of them are well positioned to win back uh, some of those seats in the Vancouver and Toronto suburbs that they would need to sort of push them over the edge in the next election. The Liberals, you know, unless things, a lot can happen between now and the next session, but I think that they, they will be vulnerable. All right. So one thing we just uh, forgot to mention, um, but I think it's worthwhile, is that uh, we've got four candidates and they're all from Eastern Canada. So uh, no uh, candidates from Western Canada, from a party with deep Western roots. So does this say anything about that? And does this say anything about the relationship that the West has with the rest of the country right now? Yeah, that's a really good question. I'll start with something that we did not mention earlier when we're talking about rules and procedures, is that by design, the party tried to limit uh, the number of candidates that would be that would end up in this race by upping the number of signatures and upping the entrance fee by a significant amount. So that's certainly uh, to the effect of limiting the number of candidates compared to last time uh, certainly worked. I don't think that the intention there was to limit it certainly to only those uh, from Eastern Canada. You had uh, Michelle Ramble, Rona Ambrose, Pierre Polyev, all these Western Canadian stalwarts of the party who would have been uh, immediate favorites to win. Any of them could have won this race, uh, who decided not to run um, for various personal reasons. Uh, and I think uh, then, you know, you just had this sort of accidental uh, situation where you have four candidates from Eastern Canada. And it's interesting to think about uh, you know, the party, the, the modern post-2003 uh, Conservative Party has been seen as sort of, you know, Calgary is its sort of, it's it's an unofficial hometown, and it sort of had this sort of strong Western base, uh, you know, that for its uh, duration. And it is really interesting um, that this has happened. And you wonder, considering that often what happens during federal election campaigns is that even though you have, you had Stephen Harper uh, from a running in a Calgary riding, he notoriously spent no time or very little time during the campaign in Calgary or in Alberta because their base is so secure there that they were spending time in areas of the country they needed to win 
to uh, to ensure that they would, you know, to, to form government. And you get this uh, naturally, you sometimes you get this in a post-election climate, especially after 2015 and this last election, when the Conservative Party lost this belly aching about, well, has, you know, has they, is it time for Alberta to abandon the Conservative Party because, you know, the Conservative Party just takes them for granted and spends all this time focusing on terror? You wonder if there's that sentiment. Again, I don't have any data and there's no reason that I would, I could, I couldn't be certain of this, but I'm sure some look at the four candidates and think, uh, sitting in the West, in the, in the West and who are the base of the party and think, well, how come, how come there's no one representing, uh, Western Canada in this race? And can I trust any of these candidates to, pay attention to Western Canada and not just take our votes and seats for granted uh, and focus on Greater Vancouver and Greater Toronto. Uh, and again, maybe for some who are more pragmatically oriented may think, well, that's what exactly what we need, need to do. We need someone from Ontario to try to win the election and win power, because if we have someone from Calgary, that immediately makes it uh, a little more difficult uh, for us to win a, a federal election. So uh, maybe it doesn't clearly answer your question, but I think that sort of poses, uh, I think, the, the kind of uh, things at play here. Um, definitely, it's something notable, uh, but I think it's going to split. I think it's going to split the membership for some. I think it'll be well. It's a necessary, a necessary evil that we uh, have someone from you know Ontario or you know out east uh, who can try to sort of win seats that were that we didn't win last time, and those who might feel really abandoned by the party that, you know, where that's supposed to have its base in Western Canada. Mm -hmm. I think a lot will come down to the results of the next election. If, if they can't get it done, then I'm, there's probably going to be a lot of people who feel disaffected, but if they're able to pull it off, they'll be like, it was all worth it. Mm -hmm. All right. So, uh, I, that covers all the topics that I wanted to go over. Um, is there anything that we didn't discuss or anything you'd like to say to the audience out there? Uh, listen to fishball podcast. Uh, <laughs> he's doing an amazing job. Uh, I think it's super cool. What, uh, what he's doing and, um, keep listening. Thank you very much. Uh, it was a great uh, pleasure to have you on the show. And we'll have to have you uh, back on uh, before the uh, next election. Okay, what, uh, quick prediction. Next election, before or after Easter 2021? After. Okay, I'm going to go with before. All right. So uh, we'll, we'll see you at some point in 2021, though. Sounds good. All right. Thanks a lot, Sanjay. We'll talk soon. Okay. Thank you so much to Professor Jaram for joining me today to talk about the conservative leadership race. And thank you to everyone listening at home. We'll be back soon with another episode.